you for all coming here to hear me talk about. Um, my um, background is in mathematics, and I spent the last 15 years working with computer scientists. I did teach uh, mathematics and computer science for five years, so actually I know it means having students in the classroom. They are all the thrills and the pains, aren't they? It's all together. So um, in Microsoft research, in fact, yes, it's true, we have 900 researchers across the globe and very, very strong PhD program. So we do get lots of students that work with us, but there are other people, students, who come to work with us as interns. So we do have a very broad exposure to the younger generation and their thinking. So the presentation that I sort of composed today um, uh, is sort of inspired by some of the talks that I heard um, earlier during the conference, and I was trying to find an angle that would uh, particularly be useful uh, for us thinking about education and learning. The work we normally do is computer science work. Uh, Microsoft Research is a laboratory looking forward, so very much away from any products. What we call is undirected research. So what you see here is, in fact, a set of uh, computer science disciplines that would be in any other university. Um, one particular area here is called computer immediate living. And that's the group I work in. And uh, my team is called Integrated Systems. It's completely cross-disciplinary. So we do have people who are working on user experience, design, architecture, the whole spectrum. And I thought perhaps to share with you a couple of things to, to get an insight how digital technology has transformed our lives and um, penetrated um, all um, um, experiences. In, I picked actually four examples because um, one is particularly important, understanding how children actually uh, want to bring technology into their magic world. The first one is called Telltable, where they want to use the latest technology that they play with in sort of education settings. So I'll tell you a couple of words about the Telltable. Then uh, um, something that's particularly appealing to students who would like to get hands-on and create something really new, uh, really real. So we all use uh, uh, digital cameras, but people People don't really know how things work and how would you program a digital camera. So the gadget here uh, example I give you is exactly about how do you put things together, you can program them and then feel very good about it because you build something that actually works. And if anybody asks you about the latest technology coming, it will be about body gestures. It's not about multi-touch anymore. It's not this anymore. It's about wave your hands in front of the uh, either uh, game console or, as you will see, medical equipment. And finally, I just want to tell you briefly about um, a, a research in actually collaborative learning that we've done, because I heard lots of talks about how do you bring technology in the, in the learning place. And it seems to me that understanding the ecology of it might be helpful. So a couple of words about um, Telltable. I'm not sure whether, how many of you have actually seen some of the YouTube videos, but it is about enabling children to bring physical things into their magical world. In this case, it's the multi-touch table. They can take pictures of, of their favorite toys, and they can distort them, they can create a, any sort of things that you can do in the digital world, cut up pictures, put a face on the top of a teddy bear that looks more like a lion. So these are the examples where actually they created um, assets and then they are moving them in a digital space and telling the story. And most importantly, they can record them themselves and put it on YouTube. And that was, by the way, the latest request for my youngest uh, son. He wanted to um, videotape himself about run, um, playing the PC game and then put it on YouTube so that everybody can see. This is a kind of baseline these days. On the, on the .NET gadget here, uh, this is basically a, a set of um, um, hardware components that can be an ended software development toolkit that enables you to create um, um, very quickly prototypes of devices. And, sorry, and uh, one particular one uh, that is being shown is a board with elements that you can create a, a camera. Um, Kinect is the latest. It is a, a, a adapt camera that enables you to do the gesture recognition. Uh, sorry, this is kind of moving without my control. And now it's being control. Now it's being considered in medical uh, field because in in environment where doctors cannot, for example, uh, use their gloves to touch things, they have to uh, instruct uh, uh, the computing environment to the gesture. Um, as, as you know, this is the, the latest, greatest part of the uh, gaming industry, that people don't really know, use any utensils anymore. They want to be able to instruct computer with their gestures. 
And uh, this example and I would like to talk about is um, about a research about learning and um, um, research practices at the computer laboratory in Cambridge that we have done in collaboration with uh, Jeremy Baumberg, a professor of nanotechnology. Um, a lot of discussion here have been how do you how do you bring technology into the learning and uh, and what do you do uh, to, to, uh, when you're transferring from so a paper paradigm into the digital paradigm what happened in nanotechnology it was very easy to get of the, get rid of pa paper because all the experiences with the uh, physics and material science of, of nanotechnology is so abstract you can't see anything anyway um, you here see the equipment, the very, very uh, complex and uh, uh, sophisticated equipment that enables scientists, um, in this case actually students, at the University of Cambridge to see how the materials look like by shining the laser lights and based on the software providing them with an image of a graph or what they have, they're, they're kind of thinking what they can see through the digital technologies. So there's no direct human experience here. It's all mediated through technology. And therefore, for this sort of research, it's extremely important to move things very quickly from the data to information to the conclusion to the findings and, in the end, the published paper. The first thing that uh, Professor Jeremy Bamberg wanted to get rid of was the paper form, which would then, um, because it's not di di native digital, would uh, interrupt this very fast flow of information. So he was considering how to replace uh, what they call a lab book. And as you know, in every research environment, la lab book is extremely important, is the way we capture our observations and the way we store our knowledge and transfer it. Now, in order to uh, facilitate that, he introduced a, uh, a replacement in digital form. In this ca case, he just rep repurposed a software that existed on the market. I think this one is actually one note. So you can record everything you've done. Now, what happens is, it's not as simple as that replacing one single artifact. It's actually created the whole workflow. So when Jeremy needed to make decision on what sort of um, digital um, software and hardware he would bring in, the first thing was about the practices and the workflow. It wasn't about any particular device. It was about what needs to be accomplished and how that could be done in the most uh, efficient way. So I'm just here showing you uh, a workflow that happens in, the, in, the, in this environment in which he needs to teach students how to run experiments, then need to verify that actually the experiments are properly done, and then at the end, they need to decide what they're going to do next. And it results in an extremely complex ecosystem of devices and content. So here I'm showing the uh, content that comes first when students are recording experiments, that's, say, one note. Uh, and then when they need to discuss things, this is a single PowerPoint slide. And professor asks, what is the point of this experiment? Can you point me to the data? And finally, when they actually have a joint discussion and make a conclusion and plan for the rest. I'm bringing this up because um, decisions are often made on an individual basis. But in fact, it is about understanding the whole um, digital environment that is going to incur and how this will be supported. Because digital is the most vulnerable of all the media. It is the most vulnerable. If you turn off electricity, you can't see it. Now, even if, you can, if, you, if your electricity is on and you can see the files, if you don't have appropriate application to look at it, you can't see it. Because we humans cannot directly consume digital. So understanding the environments is absolutely critical for our knowledge, for education, for our future. And there's the whole area about uh, how to uh, preserve the digital and um, uh, how to ensure that future generations can uh, benefit from what we know now. Um, I brought it in this context because in this particular learning environment, it was understood that the benefits of digital, which we should take advantage of, are fantastic. A very fast, aggregated data, distributed, knowledge shared, perfect. But the, next, but the thing is about cleverly putting it together to support the workflow. Okay, I, I hope I uh, didn't distract you too much from the main message. We are going to move now into network analysis. It really ties very, very uh, tightly with this um, a concept of, a, of a digital. Because the, way, the reason why we are nowadays talking about network analysis um, is because the digital technology has enabled humans to collaborate and communicate at the scales 
that we have never experienced before. It is really the digital that enabled that. So, um, what I was going to talk, go over is slightly a brief history of how things evolved with the computing technology. How we moved from first from the computer networks to the engagement. And then uh, I, I talk a little bit about the tools that are now needed for us to understand what is going in these new social ecosystems. And hopefully get us to how we can teach the next generation or perhaps it learn from the next generation, uh, how we can think about these networks and prepare for the future. Okay. So I picked this slide because it is in fact from 2004, we started looking at the networks and somebody said, okay, why don't we look at the um, discussion groups online? Because that was a, a, a realm of computer scientists. Computer scientists would mostly put, come together and discuss the technology, form the news groups. And this is indeed how it looked, it, uh, and it looks now as well. So these are the computers that are connected with each other with special proto protocols so you can send messages. And what happens is on top of it, you have a, you have a client uh, interface through which individuals can exchange messages. As I said before, digital doesn't exist unless we have a, a client, we can see things. Now, this is then enabling interaction. What uh, normally happens, there is infrastructure and there is a content. There's an engagement in the content. Okay, so, in this case, at that time, and these are at the time really staggering numbers, there were 190,000 different news groups, so different small communities, and they were exchanging many, many messages, 700,000 messages a day. And at that time, they were identified more than 9 million users. And at that time, as I said, this was a really, really um, fantastic and staggering numbers. On top of that, there is an engagement network that we can start looking at. So who is communicating with whom? Now, that was the first time uh, that sociologists actually had data about the human interaction. So it was a fantastic opportunity for them to start looking at uh, the whole environment. And truly, very quickly, what happened is, starting analyzing the social eco ecosystems, um, <clears throat> we arrived at the conclusion that it's almost like any other system. There are people that have to satisfy different roles. For this sort of um, ecosystem to work, there is somebody who is going to support the machines. So this is the person who is investing in the machines to support interaction. Then there are people who are going to be managing it. There are people who are monitoring it, researchers, and then people who are participating. So it is very, very complex ecosystem of different roles. Now, among participants in particular, and let's, let's imagine ourselves in, in this sort of net communication network, there are people who will be doing different things. And you know, you may be belonging to different uh, uh, com online communities and may assume different role in different community. When I first looked at this, I was trying, I felt very guilty because I am the one what they call um, silent searcher or non-contributor most of the time. So there are people who are leaders in the community. They're really, really active. There are people who are asking questions and leaders are the ones who will be answering or uh, answers will be ones who are answering. And there are people who are just watching what's happening. And if you ever feel guilty about it, please don't, because in almost any community, about 2% of people contribute. Everybody else consumes. Okay? <clears throat> so, uh, these were the kind of general roles that um, sociologists were aware, aware of. Um, and it was very nice that now we ha they had data to start looking at it in more detail. Now, before we go into the analysis uh, practices, let me just uh, move you closer to the uh, reality. So that was in 2004, 2012, what do we have now? There are new services appearing all over the place. And all these services are, in fact, created to satisfy some uh, human needs. Now, people like to socialize. Facebook is the perfect place. It's, it's a place where people go and uh, uh, they can communicate with their friends, they can accomplish lots of different social needs there. What, what are the numbers we're looking at? Now half billion people involved. Now, if that scale is not enough, let's just look at um, areas that are perhaps not necessarily in our main um, focal point. I know about this mostly because of the children, my own children. So, here's this another, another service, it's a Steam website, where people go and play. And 
And if you just look at the, the level of engagement now, between 1.4 million and 2.6 million at any point in time are going to be using this in, uh, infrastructure. Uh, and, and are engaging. And it's not just about playing. On the right-hand side, you can see a chat. It almost goes with it. it um, there is not only chat, but there is also grouping. There are, there are clans. People play. They, they belong to a group of people who have an accomplishment uh, um, based on their um, playing experiences. They, they get different badges. They, they get different status. So it is the whole, whole world. It's an imaginary world, but it's very, very real for them. And now, if that's not enough, this is sort of still an older picture, but a younger generation. This is my youngest son. He is not typing. He's not chatting. He's talking. He, he's talking, and that's basically the minimum now criteria. You just put your earphones and you have a um, game going on on one side, on the other side, it's a live chat. And that chat is not anymore to typing, it is to talking. So you have to understand what uh, uh, the infrastructure that's supporting this sort of engagement. And it has to be an excellent uh, uh, you know, audio, uh, it has to be an excellent response of the system when they're playing. And these children are now multitasking and so doing, from my perspective, impossible things. So, looking at these technologies and where they brought us, the question is, uh, what are the social networks? And how do we start thinking about them? If you talk to sociologists, they will talk about ties among individuals. If you talk to computer scientists, they'll start thinking about the graph structure. And the challenge for us is to bring these two together. And this is exactly what the objective of my talk is, to just explain how we are now enabling sociologists who are domain experts and a computer scientists who have technical skills and are very versed in digital, after all, the digital came from the computer science. So how these two need to, to, to uh, work together in order to enable for sociologists and then perhaps everybody else to start thinking about um, the social networks. Okay, just to, um, to motivate a little bit um, the particular tools, I, I just want to mention one thing. Um, you saw specific examples of social networks, and you understand now perhaps that uh, it, it, there is an extremely sophisticated computing infrastructure involved. Now, this computing infra infrastructure has to be somehow sustained. So somebody has to pay for it, somebody has to maintain it. If there is no engagement on the, on the top of that infrastructure, the whole system collapses. Okay, so building social network services is an extremely difficult uh, problem because there's a hardware and there is a human engagement. And if either of them is not performing as it should, the whole system collapses. If the hardware is not good enough to support X million people uh, interacting at, at, at one given time, then the system collapses. If there is infrastructure but very few people engaging, they cannot sustain the infrastructure. It can't pay for it. Okay. So um, it is extremely important for people who are building this to understand what's the healthy relationship, what is the healthy engagement among the individuals. So that brings us to the question, how would we characterize the health of the community? And this is the same question that you will have if you, for example, decide that you're going to use some portal or some engagement, even chat room or forum for the students. Understanding how to first create user interface to get the engagement going. After that's in place, to start understanding why certain topics are being discussed and others are not. Why are stu some students engaged, some are not. So, this is what we are talking about. We are talking about metrics to characterize the engagement. And that's basically is the bridge between techniques of uh, analyzing the data and then interpretation. Yeah. Now, lots of people say, uh, I get it often, but, uh, Natasha, you stay away from any formulas or any graphs. <laughs> okay, so this is, and I say, I learned this, okay, no speeches with formulas and graphs. Now, uh, my argument here is graphs are becoming quite popular, and I'm just showing here a network graph that a colleague sent me. Uh, this is his uh, uh, social network representation of Facebook uh, friends. And this graph is created by taking pictures of the friends that appear on the same photos in Facebook. So I'm just thinking, wow, this is fantastic. I mean, if now everybody gets used to looking at these graphs, then we can have a conversation about them. Yeah, good. 
So, um, about f almost now five years ago, we started a project uh, called Node Excel. And the main objective was to think how can we bring graphing to the same level as people are used to charting? And the idea came okay, well, it, there is a, one tool that we can extend and is doing charting already. And there is a, basically a spreadsheet. In this case, it's Excel. So, if you have a spreadsheet and you know how to use a spreadsheet and you know how to create a, a, a pie chart or histogram in your spreadsheet, you should be able to create a graph. That was the reasoning. So then we decided to extend Excel with a new little ribbon that would enable people to create these charts okay, from the data. So to make it easy, you can import different social network data. So if you, if you are on Facebook, you can import your friends. If you are on Twitter and you're following a hashtag, you can download information about the hashtag. It all goes into a spreadsheet. And then you can click some buttons, and then the graph should appear. So this is the idea, and this is actually what we've done. The idea was not everybody needs to know programming in order to visualize graphs. Not everybody needs to know programming to be able to identify their role as it's seen in the graph. Okay? So indeed, if you import some data, this is a Twitter data that from one conference that Microsoft held recently, um, which just shows connection of people who are tweeting. Uh, I'm bringing this up just to show you what sort of things it will do. So the, you can import the data. Then the important thing was how to teach people metrics. And I'm just bringing here some of the uh, concept graph metrics. Um, they look now like, you know, perhaps like Chinese. It is closeness, uh, centrality between the centrality, eigenvalue centrality. These are all the um, um, properties of the nodes in the graph that one can um, discuss and learn. In, the basic thing is, network is nothing else but set of these nodes, the entities and edges. And everything else is just counting, counting the edges in different ways. So it's not a big deal. All these have some formulas behind. But the meaning is interesting. And the meaning often is best understood through visual rather than mathematical formulas. So, so what I was going to do is show you a couple of examples of how you read these charts and then show you how, after we deployed it with students, how students started learning it and um, using similar vocabulary to express what they meant. Okay. One interesting thing, as I said before, is about the roles of individuals. So what is particularly interesting, if you pick any of these nodes, you can then look what is the neighborhood of, of, of a node. So if the person, if a node is a person, and then you can see how that person is linked to other individuals. So you can, for every person, extract a small graph, which we call the egocentric network, and you can start interpreting those. Okay. So going back to the roles, remember I mentioned people participate in different ways. And so if somebody is a person who is answering lots of questions, the question is how would that be reflected in a graph? So this is one example. This is a person in the middle, and there are lots of errors pointing out. So if anybody is asking a question, um, uh, uh, this, this person basically would be the one who would be answering to people. So if the edge means person answer the question to a person, then this person in the center is the one who is very Gregory, very a person very altruistic and very much engaged. Now, if you see something like this in the middle, it's very likely that a person is answering to other people, but individuals that are connected to this person also are quite chatty, and they talk to each other. So, so then you can see a very interesting, sort of a slightly messy um, pattern where we have a person who maybe is setting a topic, but then everybody else kind of uh, starts participating. And then you have a situation when things are very dramatic, as you can tell on the right-hand side. So this is a situation where multiple topics and multiple people, very strong leaders are involved, and you have a very strong discussion group. Okay. So this is just on the high level. Uh, I want to explain how, just based on nodes and, and these edges, we can start a reasoning. And I'm using the word reasoning. I'm not saying that we can... Um, it is very important to understand that this information and uh, finding patterns is the way for us to kind of create hypotheses. We still need to test this hypothesis. Okay. So 
I'm not sure how many of you are using Flickr, but I thought if I show you, you uh, an example of um, a social network where you might be familiar with, um, to see how we can extract networks. And this is a very interesting um, service because it involves on one side people who are um, publishing their uh, uh, photos, then their f photos as items who other people can comment on, and another thing is, people can tag the photos. So I have three things involved. I have humans who are interacting, and I have photos, and then I have tags. And I can create all sorts of networks. I can create a network, you know, who is talking to whom about the picture, or generally about pictures, or which tags are related to which tag, if there are um, multiple tags per picture. So, so, uh, um, the networks do not arise only from communication people to people. It can be any relationship among any items. So let me show you in this particular service, because we have people communication tags and we have individuals, we can create different um, networks. And I'm showing you one in which the link means that one person is commenting on the pictures of the other. Okay, so, so if you are interested, if we're paying attention to your pictures and Flickr, then you can draw a graph like this. You import the Flickr data, and in Excel you can create it. So uh, the person whose account um, this is is um, my colleague Mark Smith. Mark Smith is one of the leaders of the no, the Excel project. So Mark has lots of friends, and he's looking at this and saying, hmm, this is their sort of group in different clusters. And the one per per person is particularly important, because this person here, in the middle, Heather. Heather actually is the gatekeeper for the whole sub-community sub of his network. So in a way, but just looking at the placement of the nodes and connectivity, you can see which people are quite important as connectors between different, otherwise perhaps not that strongly connected um, subgroups of your friends. Okay, so I'm mentioning this because through visualization, I can now tell, tell you that this person here has a very, very high betweenness centrality. If you remember one of the keywords there was betweenness centrality. Why? Because this person sits between two clusters and therefore is very, very important person in Mark's network. Okay. Uh, I mentioned before that um, the networks are there to set hypotheses, and, uh, and this is an example to illustrate this. Again, this is a Flickr network, and some pictures you can see are connected because, they sh in this case, they share a tag. So sharing a tag, two pictures are connected if they share a tag. So you create a network and then start looking at them, and really anything you say may look like a, reading a horoscope, right? <laughs> can be any, any pattern you can try to get out. The thing is that it is important to understand where the data comes from. Once you know where the data comes from, then you can start correlating it with something that is outside the network, but explains the patterns. And I think this is important to understand. Pattern analysis within the network data is to investigate and make hypotheses. They still need to be verified. The truth is not within the network. The interpretation is in, in the expert's head. And it's a, it's, it requires human intelligence. Okay. So in this case, it turned out that Mark was in Las Vegas and taking pictures, and the way he was tagging them, in fact, corresponds very closely to the strip in Las Vegas as you go from one hotel to another. Okay. Very good. So, um, and the final thing I want to sh uh, show you about the network analysis, I want to show you a, a very um, um, common technique, and that's the, the, the filtering technique. So you may plot all the edges in the network, but then you may decide that you just want to look at the most prominent one. So you're just looking at the most prominent patterns. And I, I like this example is because it's very simple, self-contained. This is the voting statistics for the US senators. So whenever two senators uh, voted um, uh, the same, either yes or no on an issue, there is a link between them, okay? So now looking at this looks pretty um, busy and it's really hard to understand any patterns. But then I say, okay, how about if I just look at the, uh, the links 
or those nodes that have at least 65% agreement. So at least 65% of time, these two individuals said yes together or no together. And suddenly, there is a separation. Now I can see a pattern. I see two big clusters. Well, then I can add a bit more information to this. I can add information of a party affiliation. And I see very clearly now, the red are <laughs> conservatives and these are Democrats. So you can see very, very clearly now that these two actually represent something that I expected from reality. But what I didn't quite expect are the three satellite nodes right in, between, in, in the middle. Now remember this, uh, the metrics that I talked about. These three individuals, these three senators, in fact, have very high between the centrality. Of course, from the, from the party point of view, it may not be desirable in this case, um, because these are the, uh, the conservatives that are more leaning towards democratic uh, agenda. Okay, so this is a very simple example. The, uh, you can very easily do this in, in uh, Node Excel. You can just say, well, I'm not gonna, I, I want to hide those edges that are not very strong. And then the patterns appear. Okay, great. All right, so uh, just a little bit about, the, uh, about teaching uh, these sort of skills. Uh, the students, we decided to we collaborate with uh, University of Maryland, uh, Professor Ben Schneiderman, and uh, the, um, Mark Smith, myself, uh, Derek Hansel. And we have been involved in, in, uh, with students at the University of Maryland in deployment of this software to see how students will learn. And uh, just, uh, just kind of to set the expectations, once you, once you import your network, uh, originally if you if you in include the pictures and everything else in without doing anything else to the network, you may end up with a picture like this. So, first thing that we want to teach students, this is not really a good visualization to try to analyze. So, um, we needed to teach them what they should be aiming for. Okay, they should be aiming for clarity in the visualization. And Ben Schneider and a couple of colleagues, they, they, um, they in fact, um, provided the guidelines, say, a set of guidelines for students, what should be the way to design a good network. So first of all, you don't want vertices to overlap. Second, if you can avoid edges to cross, it's easier for us human to visualize and comprehend. So a number of these uh, rules. So we deploy the, the software and we're looking for different, you know, these are like homework problems. Um, students were taught uh, generally social network analysis for five weeks, and for three weeks they were using Node Excel. We gave them instructions three hours, once a week for three hours. So they had practically about nine hours of uh, using the software, and they, they gave us the reports. They had to pick the data and get data from somewhere else for some community they wanted to study. They put it in the Excel and then they were analyzing this. Now, what was striking to me is that when I was um, looking at these reports at the end, first of all, they all really wanted to get very clean, nice visualizations. They could move any node by hand if they wanted and so on. That was up to them. But most fascinating was the language they were using. So in this case, the student was collecting data about maintenance of a network, uh, the list server community. Okay? And, and this is the communication among the individuals. And he identified who was the admin at the time. The question was, who else could become an admin in the community of maintaining the list server? That was the question. So the student was saying, my initial hypothesis is a leader should possess a high between the centrality and high eigenvalue centrality. So the student was in fact arguing about what the characteristics of an individual would be in the terminology that uh, um, she learned only within the past three weeks. But we are not talking about an expert. This person has never seen the formula for between the centrality or eigenvalue centrality, but can visually identify this after give, being given examples. And not only, it, it wasn't only just to characterize this, but also in the new diagram, the hypothesis was this other person should be, because 
um, or these properties. And all of these properties are, in fact, um, expressed in a language that they just learned. So to me, it was uh, uh, um, all these doubts about whether people could learn kind of went away after I've seen, and we had about uh, um, quite a number of students, but uh, eight different homeworks, and all of them were of this sort. Now, you don't know one necessarily to spend time manually doing things. So when we have large graphs, we are thinking how to automate um, a better readability of the graphs. So if you have a graph like this, we would like to s separate things into different boxes, so you can see groups and sub-communities in the different boxes. So there's lots of research going on in different layouts. So this is the previous one that does the clustering into groups, and the second one is actually moving the clusters around. Okay, now I'd just like to conclude, I have a couple of more minutes, just to conclude, uh, reflect a bit of what, what it all means and why this is so important. Uh, first of all, we are thinking about um, computing technology and how it's mediating compu communi communication. And that has lots of implications for everybody, in, by the, you know, for the governments thinking about how to enable the society and how it can influence the society through the media. Um, uh, furthermore, we know that um, it is absolutely impossible now to, um, to imagine any big event without Twitter. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this was actually four years ago, almost now, when Obama had his campaign. On one side, he's talking to the crowd. On the other side, there's even more crowd talking about him. So this symbiosis of uh, technology and, the f uh, um, and our normal kind of physical pr uh, life practices are coming uh, so strongly in a very, very close symbiotic relationship. Um, this is colleague um, Ben Schneiderman that I mentioned from University of Maryland. He and colleagues at the University of Maryland are working uh, um, very closely with the governments on understanding how they can increase the social participation of individuals. And that applies everywhere. Wherever there is a need to help each other, humans can help each other. How can we connect them and then inform them and motivate them to act? So there's lots, lots of activities going in that, in that place. Yeah, but the, uh, one thing that was very intriguing to me, um, just as you may remember, uh, yeah, it was during the Roosevelt time when Einstein sent an email, sorry, sent a message to, <laughs> to Roosevelt <laughs> about, about the, the, the issues about the nuclear uh, power that just appeared. So there are always positive and negative things. Whenever there, are, there, is, a, uh, there is a big discovery or a big, uh, um, change, either from technology point of view or scientific or research point of view, one has to be very, be very careful. And what has happened with the social media, this is exactly what we are now observing, the same thing. Uh, I think Obama got a letter from uh, uh, Ben Schneider and a couple of colleagues, basically informing him that social power has arrived. And there are many different ways to think about it and many different ways to exploit it. Therefore, we need to do lots of research and understanding because this time we are directly working with human lives. <clears throat> now, a, a small contribution that we are trying to make is um, based on the Nord Excel um, activities. We have started a social media research foundation, which is a, a non for profit organization to promote education and social network analysis. And so if you are interested, um, this is a portal where you can find more, more information uh, about social media network analysis. Those people who are enthusiasts and would like to use uh, software and start um, um, creating your own networks, you can, you're definitely not going to be alone. We created a portal where you can uh, upload your graphs and you can share um, information about your data. So this is a, quite an active community of individuals who are sharing experiences, how to create uh, and, uh, the graphs, how to analyze them, and um, how to interpret them. For example, if you click on any of these uh, images, you will get, get a, a detailed graph. Now, what's also very nice, if you're really proud of your uh, uh, layout, because you can mo mo model this, you can change the colors, you can change the size, it's really become extremely kind of personal expression. You can, you can save this and other people can use it. And you may get five stars, who knows. Um, finally, if, if you are interested in the resources on uh, network analysis, uh, based on our experience, we've kind of put together uh, a book. It's a little bit outdated now because it's about two years ago. Um, 
and it really explains the basics of the network analysis and shows how um, the, this spreadsheet paradigm can be used uh, to analyze data uh, and uh, reinforce this notion that yes, indeed, social networks have been created because of the digital and computing technologies, but it's absolutely critical to enable domain experts, who are not necessarily computer scientists, but domain experts to be able to use this data and gain insights. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'll close with this.